bless us today with joy as we study the Bible together. What a good gift you've given to us in the scriptures. And pray that you would enlighten us, illumine us. We're at that place where we haven't traveled as often in the church, sort of uh, down some of the side roads of the scripture as we begin to go through some the, of the uh, minor prophets. We pray for uh, wisdom and counsel but also application to be able to put to good use the things that we learn in our daily living. Help us to remember always that the purpose of our study in the scripture is not scholarship, but workmanship. For Paul said to Timothy, study to show thyself approved unto God a workman who does not need to be ashamed. In Jesus' name, we all pray, amen. amen. All right. So we are at a great place. We are moving along. How are y'all doing on your Bible reading? Y'all really want to know. I'm finding the New Testament. Isaiah's got me bogged a little bit. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the Isaiah does get a little bit harder. <clears throat> and it's, you just have to keep waiting for, looking for the good stuff. You know, you get through some of the harder stuff. But It jumps into some good, a little bit of stories like Hezekiah today, and I remember yeah. that, so yeah. that sort of tied you over. <laughs> yeah, that's true. It's an ex such an exceptional book, though, and I think you'll get, you'll get used to reading Isaiah more <coughs> in time. I think uh, the hardest part to me for Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel is that you know, you're know you reading some sermons, and some of the sermons were appropriate for right at that particular point, which does seem like it has a lot of real bearing upon us, because what Damascus, for example, was up to doesn't really concern us a whole lot, but you have to read about it, so uh, that's the hardest part. And I think Jeremiah, the fact that he was so scattered he had uh, he's getting his book reading his book is like reading a diary that wasn't put together you know it's like you get sections of it and he tells the story and then he has some of the sermons in there and you go like well that don't fit there <laughs> so it has that little quality to it if i had time to read all the footnotes that would help a little bit yeah yeah, yeah. <clears throat> I think it's something that when you go through the Bible like we're trying to do now, at least you get familiar with it, but it hopefully will make us want to go back and read it a little bit slower when we can, when we can look at the notes. I, I love the notes to the uh, NIV study Bible and the ESV study Bible. They are really just really they are. different. Because <laughs> if I'm going like, oh, I'm going to Hear that? Listen to that. I, I, I know, I didn't realize I was that wired. Okay, so we are going to talk a little bit about uh, sort of where we're headed in the next few weeks with uh, as, as we begin to move toward a conclusion for our studies. I'm going to, to put a few things up about, we've talked about Isaiah, but I do want to put a few things up about the prophets and, and how they all um, sort of fit together here. And this may be helpful. I'm going to put Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel because these are the four major prophets. And knowing a little bit about their time in the middle, and then we'll go back and fill in some of the gaps on some of the people sort of chronologically so you'll know how the other uh, prophets fit in. Okay, does that sound good? In other words, I would like for you to know sort of from these people what was going on and then those other people whose books were not as big, where did, where did they fit over here? So let's talk about Isaiah first. In the, in the history of, of Isaiah's ministry, the Assyrians were already 
on to Israel and coming for Judah. So that's the first thing. So that kind of gives you a historical setting. So whenever you read Isaiah, you know that that um, that Assyria was the bad power. Now, some of the people that talked about Assyria were people like Jonah and, uh, and, and people who talked about Assyria were people like Nahum. They were two of the, two of the prophets that talked about them negatively. Jonah, uh, you know the story of Jonah, <coughs> how that he didn't want to go to Nineveh because he wanted the Assyrians to be destroyed. So a lot of people think that Jonah didn't go because he was patriotic and, um, and they think that, uh, that he was just, uh, or they think he, either he was patriotic or they think that he was prejudiced. I think more people think that he was prejudiced. Don't you, Miss Kay? Well, you know, when people like, he didn't want to go just because he just wanted them Gentiles to die. That's what I have thought when I was a kid. But either way, whatever the motive was, uh, he didn't want to go. And some people think it was because he knew <laughs> if he didn't go, God would curse them. And somehow they would be eliminated from being the ones to destroy Israel. But anyway, uh, Nahum gives the promises that uh, Israel is eventually going to see Assyria defeated. So I, I want you to do something different. Let's take your Bible and turn to the book of Nahum. Now you're going to have to use your concordance or your table of contents. I recognize that. So you might as well go ahead and just bite the bullet. So turn, when you turn to the book of Nahum, to see what I'm talking about, to understand what I'm trying to do, what's the first sentence in the book? An oracle concerning Nineveh, the book of the region of Nahum. That's it. And uh, a jealous and avenging God is the Lord. <coughs> uh, the Lord is avenging and wrathful. He takes vengeance. He's uh, slow to anger, great power, etc. His way is in the whirlwind and storm and the clouds are the dust of his feet. Uh, he rebukes the sea, makes it dry, and so forth. Who can stand before his indignation? Uh, the first chapter is very introductory, very theological about God. Now, look at verse number 8. Even in a, he protects those who take refuge in him, even in a rushing flood, he will make a full end of his adversaries and will pursue his enemies into darkness. Why do you plot against the Lord? He will make an end. No adversary will rise up twice. Okay, just uh, come down a little more to verse number 12. Uh, Thus says the Lord, they're full of strength and many. They will be cut off and pass away. Though I have afflicted you, I will afflict you no more. I will break off his yoke from off you. The Lord has commanded concerning you shall, uh, your name shall be perpetuated no longer. Verse 15, um, it says that look on the mountains, the feet of one who brings good tidings, proclaims peace, celebrate your festivals, O Judah, fulfill your vows, for never again shall the wicked invade you, for they are utterly cut off. Now, in chapter 2, you have the story told of what's going to happen to Assyria and Nineveh before it happens. It's not easy to see or figure out, but it's telling the story. A shatterer has come against you. It's written in poetic language. Guard the ramparts, watch the road, gird your loins, collect all your strength. The Lord is restoring the majesty of Jacob. Uh, verse number three, the shields of his warriors are red, his soldiers are clothed in crimson. The metal on the chariots flashes on the day when he musters, this, uh, musters them. 
The chargers prance, the chariots race madly through the streets. They rush to and fro. Their appearance is like torches. They dart like lightning. This is a, okay, so you know how a prophecy works, you know, where a, a person is getting a mental picture of how events are going to come to pass. They're not always clear. But Nahum sees something happening to Nineveh. He sees these armies with their red, the red uh, clothing, and he sees them coming with torches in the street. And he's telling or foretelling the fall of Nineveh. Now, the fall of Nineveh is an incredible story that historically happened because the Babylonians knew of their great power and their wealth, and Babylon wanted to, they wanted to overtake Assyria's world dominance. And so it was a head-to-head -head clash with two of the great, great armies. And so the Assyrians were comfortably safe in Nineveh until a storm came and there was an erosion around a wall and the Babylonians were able to get into the city because of the storm. And that's what, that's what Nahum is seeing. So he's, he's telling the story of the destruction. Look at verse 10. Devastation, desolation, destruction, hearts faint, knees tremble, loins quake, faces pale. What became of the lion's den, the cave of the young lions? Uh, Verse 13, God says, See, I am against you, says the Lord of hosts, and I will burn your chariots. The sword shall devour your young lions. I will cut off your prey. And then God gives this sort of a um, reminder of the city, what it was like. He, he, he laments against it. It's a city full of bloodshed, utterly deceitful, full of booty, no end to the plunder. The crack of whip and rumble of wheel, gallop and horse, all of these things. Heads of cor heaps of corpses, dead bodies without end. Do you all see that? Verse number three. Debaucheries of the prostitute. Um, there are, God says, I am against you. Verse six, I'll throw filth at you and treat you with contempt. All who you will shrink from you and will say, none of us devastated. Um, so, I wanted to show you a little so bit how many more. years was this before actually Nineveh was destroyed? You know, Nahum prophesied early, fairly early on. It was in the period of time. Let's see if it gives us a... But yeah, it was, it was while they were increasing in their power. But I do not know the time. Let me see if I've got it here. Um... Okay, yeah, it was about 650. So it would have been about um, 25, about 25 years before it ever actually took place. So he was, he was seeing these things happen before they occurred 20 to 25 years beforehand. And you know, um, that's, uh, that's amazing. God tries to keep his people encouraged that even though they're going through a hardship, that eventually what goes around comes around. Have you all ever heard that? <laughs> <laughs> what goes around comes around. So, so jo Jonah was the guy who didn't want to participate in the, in the lament against uh, Nineveh. Nahum prophesied against it. Isaiah actually prophesied against it and in and in Isaiah 38 and 39, which uh, Carolyn, you were just talking about, we saw how that Assyria had already taken over Israel and then they were trying to get to Judah and God prevented them from being able to go because he struck down all of those people, the death angel outside of the camp. And what a devastation that must have been. 180 some thousand. It was incredible. Incredible number of losses. Incredible. I am quite sure that that, that was a devastating thing. Now, we really, in sequence, 
would probably put Daniel and Ezekiel before Jeremiah because these two went into the captivity. They went into captivity with Babylon. Now, let's talk just a little bit. You, you do know <clears throat> Babylon is modern-day what? Iran, Iraq. 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 So, so uh, went to captivity, uh, and, the, and they went early. And the reason why they went early is because it was the plan of... Uh, of King Nebuchadnezzar. He was, Nebuchadnezzar was first the general and then he became the king. But it was his plan to take away from the city of Jerusalem their finest resources. So he took their brain power and their skilled, uh, skilled labor and sort of crippled Jerusalem. He put a, what we call a vassal king whose name was Jehoiakim into a position of leadership, but he made him walk the tightrope. You know what I mean? He was. He said, I'm gonna get, let y'all have a Jewish king, and he will be your king, but he's gonna be my king. He's gonna do what I tell him to do. So Jehoiakim was they're always trying to rebel, and it was like a, just a bad time, and, and so Nebuchadnezzar kept tightening the clamps until finally, uh, I don't know if you know the story in the last chapter of Jeremiah, chapter 52, there is the story of how Nebuchadnezzar has had enough with this vassal king. So he brings him into his court and he says, okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to kill your two sons in front of you and I want you to see that. So they execute his two sons. I don't know how they do it. I don't remember. But then they poke out his eyes. Zedekiah's eyes and it was the last thing he saw and that was like this is it you, you know, no more that was the so he, this man was really cruel Nebuchadnezzar actually became the probably the most powerful despot that had been alive at that time he had absolute power nothing that uh, I mean when you get to the next next two or three kingdoms, they had division of labor. They had other people. Their laws helped to mediate their, but Nebuchadnezzar was an absolute despot. He was the total in charge guy. So when Ezekiel went into uh, captivity and Daniel went into captivity, they went in early, and their intention was to learn. They came in there to learn uh, the ways of, of the culture. Now this is just simply a typical kind of response. If you're going to have, if you're gonna build a, a culture, if you're gonna build an empire, you want people to buy into your your whole philosophical outlook. And so they started brainwashing the young kids. That's what they were doing. You saw the same thing in Germany. I don't know if you remember hearing the stories about World War II when the Nazi youth were put into camps and they learned all of the propaganda. They, they each one, they drank the Kool-Aid, as we say. They were all raised up to believe certain Nazi philosophies about Jews and everything else. So that's what they were doing. Now Daniel and his friends, <coughs> um, <coughs> Hananiah, uh, you remember their names, Azariah and Mishael. There you go, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> and what was Daniel, what was, since you know Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael's uh, Babylonian names, what was Daniel's Babylonian name? I don't know, but I guess maybe Belshazzar. I don't know. Bel Belta, Belta Shazzar. Yeah, it was. So they changed their names because 
I don't know if you're aware of this, but there is cer a certain authority that comes with naming anything. So when the king changed their names, he was saying, this is who you are. He was trying to define their identity. And so, um, but they didn't become that. They, their names being changed, if they, their character was pure. So Daniel, even though they did learn the ways that they had to learn to be able to survive, they kept held, holding fast to the law of God. It was the testimony of the power of God's word in their life. So I want to just share a couple of things about Daniel. First of all, there are two parts to the book, and this is not a hard book to understand at all. There is the personal, and there is the prophetic. Those are the two parts to the book of Daniel. Personal meaning you have narrative stories that are told about Daniel's life. For example, in Daniel chapter 1, he's, you tell the story about him being moved there and how he was tested with the food and how he responded with, with grace and dignity and did not uh, upset the people too much, but he asked for a, a test to see if his diet would be successful instead of him eating the king's diet, and it worked. Daniel chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar has a vision which is a very prophetic vision and so we have a little blending of the prophetic as, as this vision but it's Daniel who interprets the dream. In Daniel chapter 3 we have the story of them being in the, uh, the, the lion's den, uh, excuse me, the fiery furnace in Daniel chapter 3. That's when of course we saw the, the personal deliverance. Daniel chapter 4 is when there was the humbling of Nebuchadnezzar and Daniel again interpreting a dream. Daniel chapter 5 was with Belshazzar who was the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar who was drinking out of the cups that came out of the temple that Hezekiah showed during the time of Isaiah 38 and 39 when he showed the, those utensils to the Babylonians a hundred and some years later, they went back and got them, and they were sitting there in Daniel 5 toasting their gods, and Daniel is watching it happen when the hand appears on the wall, and then there is the fall of Babylon. So that takes place in Daniel chapter 5, and there is the rise of the Medes and Persians, and this is when we start moving to the prophetic part of the book. In Daniel chapter 6, we have the story of the lion's den, which is, uh, you know, we is another personal part, but in Daniel 7 through Daniel 12, there is the telling of all of history from the time of the Babylonian captivity until the time Jesus comes. And it even tells the end of time. So you have an extraordinary book in the, in the book of Daniel, but it is so hard to understand. If you don't know a few things, I'm going to get on my knee for relief. So uh, if you don't know that there were people like Alexander the Great who were going to come in the interim between when this book was written and when Jesus came, you wouldn't understand. But they talk about the leopard. And it was the leopard that was the symbol for the Greeks. So the whole, the whole story of Alexander the Great is told in the book of Daniel. And the story of Darius is told, and the story of, us, of um, the Seleucids and others who became the ruling power after Alexander the Great's kingdom was, uh, was divided between his three generals. And then it was the Romans and how they came. I mean, it's a really incredible book. As a matter of fact, Lou, let me tell you something kind of funny. The book is so good at pre-telling history that a lot of people say that book was written after it happened like it had been written before it happened because nobody could have done that. That's how good it is. So it has actually been doubted by people who are skeptical because it's so accurate in telling the story of what's going to happen. So a great prophecy, you know. 
Now, Ezekiel was a, an eccentric man who prophesied during the same time as Daniel and Jeremiah. Uh, I like Ezekiel's personality because he's flaky and weird, and sometimes people who are flaky and weird have interesting things. I want to talk a lot. Let's do this for fun. Since we're doing more than just trying to learn the book, let's go to the book of Ezekiel. And, and uh, I want to show you the first chapter. It is, it's extraordinary when you see how a man who is educated and eccentric like he is, when he starts trying to describe something that's hard to describe. That's a long book, too. It is yeah, a long yeah. book. I have to say, when I get to it, I do hate to admit it, but I kind of dread it. I say, Lord, just help me to get through it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so here we are, first chapter. I want to just give this to you just so you can see uh, what it was like. So the Lord lets him have a vision of heaven. And he, he's trying to describe what it's like. Verse 2 says, On the fifth day of the month, the fifth year of the exile of King Jehoiakim, the word of the Lord came to the priest Ezekiel, son of Buzi, in the land of the Chaldeans by the river Kibar. And the hand of the Lord was on him there. And as I looked, a stormy wind came out of the north, a great cloud with brightness around it, and fire flashing forth continually. And in the middle of the fire, something like a gleaming amber. In the middle of it was something like four living creatures. This was their appearance. They were of human form. Each had four faces. Each of them had four wings. Their legs were straight. The soles of their feet were like the sole of a calf's foot. They sparkled like burnished bronze. Under their wings, on their four sides, they had human hands, and the four had their faces and had their wings thus. Their wings touched one another. Each of them moved straight ahead without turning as they moved. Now, as for the appearance of their faces, the four had the face of a human being, the face of a lion on the right side, the face of an ox on the left side, the face of an eagle. Such were their faces. Their wings were spread out above. Each creature had two wings, each of which touched the wing of another, while two covered their bodies. Each moved straight ahead. Wherever the spirit would go, they went without turning as they went. In the middle of the living creatures, there was something that looked like burning coals of fire, like torches moving to and fro among the living creatures. The fire was bright, the lightning issued from the fire, the living creatures darted to and fro like a flash of lightning. Now, if I were your teacher and you were in my school and I wanted to really have fun, I would say, draw that picture from memory, and I would love to see how you all would do it. <laughs> that would be tough, wouldn't it? Just think about all of those things that are said about what these creatures look like. and So he's seeing a picture of pageantry because in the presence of God there are these cherubim, these seraphim which are a, 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 a group of angels and they are just moving about in some very definite order very procedural, very pompous, very uh, royal regal and uh, as they're moving around, there are these fires and flashes of fire, and there is this uh, reflection upon, upon the sea of glass. Later you'll read. And so there's all of these brilliant things that are displaying God's great glory. Now Ezekiel's story begins with that because I think God was saying to Ezekiel, God is in control. You know, you're tempted to look at Babylon with all of their great power. Maybe you should take a look at what heaven is like, and then you might have a little bit different view about Babylon. If you think that, if you think Nebuchadnezzar is something, 
You ought to see God, right? Yeah. So I think that's one reason why we start off with that in Ezekiel. It's because Ezekiel was given that word to kind of encourage him. Ezekiel and Daniel together? They, they were... They were together, but I don't know that they were physically together. I, I don't know. They never that. mentioned they went into each other. Captivity. Yeah. Yeah, they did go into captivity together. It was along the same time. It probably did not happen concurrently. They probably were not with one another, but they certainly knew of one another. I mean, I'm positive that Ezekiel, Daniel, and Jeremiah were aware of each other's ministry. And Daniel. They, they did. Ezekiel's um, ministry was, you know, I'm uh, just speaking out of turn, I guess, maybe, but I think one of his ministries was he kept people focusing on God's bigger plan. You know, Jeremiah was one of the people who, t t he was like a pastor. He was like a pastor who loved them and told them what they needed to do in their daily living and tried to encourage me to be with him because you got you know personally you all need to surrender please don't resist against this he's going to hurt you you know that was jeremiah's ministry so he was I think in the homeland he was in the homeland but ezekiel was the one who was with the people in babylon and he kept bringing them to this image of god has got plans for us you know we've got a future we're going to get out of here and his was a message of hope and vision for the things that were beyond what was going on in that 70 years. He did talk about some absolutely special things. Um, in Ezekiel, for example, uh, chapter 31, chapter 34, he brings up a lot of good things about the new covenant. And I want to talk to you all about that just for a minute. So. Um, in the, in the Old Testament, or Old Covenant, we have, we have uh, <coughs> really Ab the Abraham's covenant that God made with Abraham is very important. God promised he was going to bless the whole earth through Abraham. You remember that. And, of course, he did. He blessed the whole earth through Abraham's son, who was the seed, who was Jesus. So... All of us are children of Abraham. So we've been brought into the Abrahamic covenant by faith. And that's, a, that's an extraordinarily important moment. In, in the discussion of the new covenant, one of the things that God is bringing through Ezekiel is that there will come a day when the Lord will put his law upon our heart that it would be in us and not outside of us that he was going to change our heart and give us a heart of clay instead of a heart of stone and that we would uh, know the Lord and he would know us. There were several special graces that were promised in the new covenant. Well, when Jesus broke the bread and he poured the cup, he said in essence that that covenant that Jeremiah talked about and that Ezekiel talked about is now being fulfilled because everybody who is a follower of Jesus I'm going I'm going to from that I'm going to put my law in your heart so you'll want to do my law you'll desire to obey me you won't have to you won't have to have it external like trying to make you do something but it'll be in you you, you understand that, right? So that was one of the great things that Ezekiel contributed. He added to the explanation of the new covenant and what it would be like. Do you understand that? You get that? That's one of those things that we don't talk about much, but it's so important, the whole notion of how God changed having the law on a stone and how instead now he said, I'm just going to help you to know the law, what my expectation is, because I'm going to give you Jesus, and Jesus fulfill the law, so you, you just have this, you just live what you do as Jesus, you live like Jesus, you let Jesus live through you, and all of the law be taken care of, amen, that's the way it works, so, 
To those people that don't believe that Jesus has come, they still abide by the old law. They do. It's a sad thing, isn't it? Yep. Mm -hmm. I have a friend that texts me <clears throat> that her brother-in-law is still looking for the Messiah. Yeah. Yeah, I hear those kind of things too, and I'm thinking, man, how can they have missed that? I don't know. Especially the hundreds and hundreds of them. Hey, go down to some of the old countries, it's proof right there that this, that this happened. Yeah, I know. But that is, you're so right. I think that's, that's really hard. I want to share a little bit about some of the people here. Uh, one, of the, one of the guys who is really important at this time, who fits into this area here, would be Habakkuk. Um, may I toss this over there and y'all throw this away, would you please? As I get to these things, I just want to be gone. So, all right, Habakkuk. So he comes between. Yeah, he comes in before, at, at along this same time that Jeremiah and all this stuff is going on. So I want us, let's turn to the book of Habakkuk. Again, I know it's hard, but I want you to go there. You'll have to probably find your table of contents again and get to it. But. So when Habakkuk wrote the, the Babylonians were coming, it was like when, um, when, when Nahum wrote the Babylonians were coming to Nineveh. Well, when Habakkuk wrote the Babylonians were coming to Judah, they were coming for God's people. They were coming for Jeremiah and all of them. So he says, uh, the, pro the oracle that the prophet Habakkuk saw, how long shall I cry for help and you will not listen or cry to you violence and you will not save? Why do you see me make me see wrongdoing and look at trouble? Destruction and violence before me, strife and contention arise so the law becomes slack, justice never prevails, the wicked surround the righteous, therefore judgment comes forth perverted. Look at the nations and see, be astonished, be astounded, the work is being done in your days that you were would not believe if you were told. For I am rousing the Chaldeans, that's the, the Babylonians, that fierce and impetuous nation who march through the breadth of the earth to seize dwellings not their own. Dread and fearsome are they. Their justice and dignity proceed from themselves. Their horses are smaller than leopards, more menacing than wolves at dusk. Their horses change. They come from afar. They fly like an eagle swift to devour. They come for violence, faces pressing forward. Gather captives like sand as kings. They scoff at rulers. They make sport. And verse number 12, and he says, Are you not from of old, O Lord, my holy God? Or the, you, you shall not die. O Lord, you have marked them for judgment, and you, O Lord, have established them for punishment. Your eyes are too pure to behold evil. You can't look on wrongdoing. Why do you look on the treacherous people or silent when the wicked swallow the, those more righteous than they? You have made people like the fish of the sea, like the crawling things that have no ruler. The enemy brings all of them with a hook. He drags them out with his net. He gathers them in the sand and he rejoices and exalts. He sacrifices to his net and makes offerings to his sand. So anyway, is he then to keep on emptying his net, destroying nations without mercy? God answers, I will stand in my watch post and station myself on the rampart and I will watch to see what he will say to me. Then the Lord answered me, write the vision, make it plain on tablets, a runner may read it. There's a vision for the appointed time that speaks of the end. It does not lie. If it seems to tarry, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. Look at the proud. Their spirit is not right in the righteous will live by their faith. Uh, wealth is treacherous. The arrogant do not endure and so forth. Now, okay, all of this, I've almost read the book for you. So you see, when you get ready to check it off, you can put it down there that you've already read it. <laughs> But here's, what, here's what's going on. Habakkuk is looking at the upheaval, and he is saying, I don't get it, God, because these people are worse than we are. Why would you let them be the ones to, to beat us? We're better people than they are. 
We are not what we ought to be, but they're horrible people. And God is saying, I am the Lord. And um, he is defending his actions. He raises up nations and he brings them down. And so you learn about this in chapter 2. When you get to chapter 3, I'd like for you to go there, please. In verse number 2, <clears throat> this is how Habakkuk ends. He said, O Lord, I have heard of your renown, and I stand in awe, O Lord, of your work. In your own time, revive it. So in your own time, make it known. In, in wrath, you remember mercy. So God came from Timon, the Holy One from Mount Paran. His glory covered the heavens. The earth was full of his praise. The brightness was like the sun, and so forth. I want to skip down to uh, verse number 17, or verse number 16. So I hear and I tremble within, my lips quiver at the sound of all of the destruction. Rottenness enters my bones and my steps tremble beneath me. I wait quietly for the day of calamity to come upon the people who attack us. So I am waiting for God to make what goes around comes around to the Babylonians. You all follow me? <coughs> Verse 17. Look at this. But though the fig tree does not blossom and no fruit is on the vines, though the produce of the olive fails and the, yields, fields, and the fields yield no food, though the flock is cut off from the fold and there is no herd in the stalls, yet... I will rejoice in the Lord. I will exult in the God of my salvation. God the Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He makes me tread upon the heights. All right, so th this book ends with a resolution of an inner conflict <coughs> that Habakkuk had. He was upset with God. He was like Job in that he didn't understand what God was doing. He was like Jonah, in that he didn't like what God was doing. And he complains and prays. But at the end, he says, God is the Lord. He's doing what he's doing. I'll be patient because he will bring eventually vengeance upon the ones who are being used by him to bring punishment to us. So Habakkuk is a very important figure, kind of like with the inward life during this time of what's going on. So I want to throw out a couple of other people here that I think would be good. I want to go back up here to Micah, <clears throat> because Micah was a contemporary of Isaiah. He, he was working during the time, and so was Hosea. So let's look at those two together. Let's go first to Micah and then to Hosea. Let's see what time it is. Okay, so find Micah. And like I said, use your concordance or your table of contents. Seems like Micah comes before Nahum. Micah, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah. It does. It comes before Nahum. All right. There we go. So if you look at the first title, let's see, again, this helps you to place the book. The first chapter of the book of Micah, the first chapter, the word of the Lord that came to Micah of Moresheth in the days of kings Jotham, Ahaz and Hezekiah of Judah, which he saw concerning Samaria and Jerusalem. All right, you see, that helps you right there because, Carolyn, when you came in, you made reference to uh, Isaiah 38 and 39. Mm -hmm. This is exactly when Micah was ministering, right there. In Isaiah chapter 7, there is a reference to Ahaz, who was the bad king that Isaiah served with who killed his children. So 
Micah was a contemporary of Isaiah. They, they served together. But it also says that Micah ministered just like Isaiah did to Israel, the northern kingdom, and to Jerusalem, which was the southern kingdom, which meant that Micah and uh, him had a good, they had a, a good ministry going together. Now, the book of Micah is about some of the things that are judgment that's coming toward uh, Judah. You'll see that in chapter 1. You'll find the reasons for the God's judgment because the Lord doesn't just punish without letting people know why they're being punished. One of the things that he gives against them is uh, he talks about their leadership, the corruption in their leadership in Judah, and he talks about how they have turned from his law and so forth. Chapter 4, he promises that they're going to be restored, that even though they're going to go through this time of captivity, that he will bring them through and he will take idolatry from them in chapter 4 and chapter 5. And then in chapter 6, there is this beautiful um, passage that talks about what God is looking for, what God requires just a beautiful little scripture and then chapter 7 has got one of my favorite passages in it as well I want to read those to you just for fun <clears throat> so in chapter 6 verse 6 with what then shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high shall I come before him with burnt offerings with calves a year old will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams with ten thousands of rivers of oil, shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? And then the answer, He has told you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, to walk humbly with your God? Amen. That's a familiar verse. That's a familiar <laughs> verse. Look at chapter 7 and verse number 8. Well, let's start in verse 7. But as for me, I will look to the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. Do not rejoice over me, O my enemy. When I fall, I shall rise. When I sit in darkness, the Lord will be a light to me. I must hear or I must bear the indignation of the Lord because I have sinned against him until he takes my side and executes judgment for me. He will bring me out to the light I shall see his vindication. Then my enemy will see and shame will cover her who said to me, where is your God? My eyes will see her downfall. Now she will be trodden down like the mire of the streets. Okay. So um, this is a, a big statement of faith. It's, uh, it's a, the essence of it is saying that you know, we are, uh, we, we have had a lot of taunting. Where is your God? Where is your God? That's just Psalm 42, uh, Psalm 130, uh, not, Psalm 137, when they were hanging up their harps on the willow trees uh, by the rivers of Babylon, the people came by and said, sing us a song. Where is your God? All of these things have been going on. And so Micah is saying, you know what God's going to do? God's going to go ahead and let me stand here and bear my shame, but in the end, he's going to pick me up, walk me out, and he's going to present me in front of everybody and all of us as having been cleansed and purged <coughs> and purified, and, and we're going to be restored. So it's a big statement of faith that he's saying that God is going to bring us back to that point. So again, all of these things are just all put together, and it's just sort of like a puzzle, though, knowing how to do it. Now back up to Hosea because I think Hosea is one of the most beautiful books in the Old Testament and it does not get nearly the recognition that it ought to get. It is beautiful poetry. Um, Hosea and I'm going to put him into a place. He up here, if you'll look at chapter 1 and verse 1, the Lord, the word of the Lord that came to Hosea, son of Beeri, in the days of King Uzziah, and Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, 
and in the days of King Jeroboam, son of Joash of Israel. So you see, this was the time that it's all right here together. Now Hosea's book has two parts. And the first part is the, tra is the tragedy of his home life. Okay? And the second one is the tragedy of his homeland. And that's an easy way to remember it. So what this happens here, and let me move this out of the way because I want you to see it. I want you to see the gravity works too. <laughs> so um, what you have is in the first chapter of Hosea, how many of you know the story of Hosea? If you know the story, just tell me. About Gomer. About Gomer, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. You know the story of Hosea, Lou? You know it a little, and do you all know it some? Okay, he was, uh, he was told to marry a woman who became an adulteress. I don't think she was an adulteress when he married her. I think she, she was an adulteress, but she was not in adultery. Okay, you understand what I mean? So, Hosea married a bad, a bad girl. Her name was, and I hate that her name has been messed up by Barney Fife's crew. <laughs> Gomer, but her name was Gomer or Gomer. So anyway, she was, uh, she was unfaithful. Hosea began to suspect some uh, improprieties, and he gives us the hints of that by the names of his children. So the child, the children that are named are named like Lo Ruhamah which means no, no kin of mine. Okay, it means this is no kin of mine. Uh, you know, the other names that were, would be like division. The child would bring, bring in, instead of unity in the home, the child was bringing division. So when you read the first three chapters of Hosea, what you find is a man who is ripped up at the loss of his family, at something that was valuable, precious to him. And he hurts. And it's a picture of God giving up his bride, his wife, being unfaithful, being in spiritual adultery. And how God is torn inwardly to have to sever his relationship with them because of their unfaithfulness. How he, how he, you know, Hosea had to see his wife go into the slave market. She was sold into slavery. And God was going to be watching the, his people being sold into slavery. So it's a, it's a story of a man who first feels what God is experiencing to a degree, and then he explains what God is experiencing, which makes the book so beautiful, so touching, because it's written with very beautiful language and very compelling uh, words. For example, go to Hosea 11. Let's just look at a couple of them so you'll appreciate it. <clears throat> Chapter 11. Here is a picture of God that we don't get very often. But this is God speaking, and he says, When Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt I called my son. The more I called them, the more they were, went from me. They kept sacrificing to the Baals and offering incense to idols. <clears throat> Yet it was I who taught Ephraim to walk. I took them up in my arms. They did not know that I healed them. I led them with cords of human kindness, with bands of love. I was to them like those who lift infants to their cheeks. I bent down to them and fed them. Now, do you see this picture? This is God saying that his nation, he was like a father, and he was, kept picking them up, and he kept bringing them to his cheek. He kept holding them and caring for them and helping them to learn how to walk 
and they kept going astray, kept going astray. And then, you know, as he's feeling all of this loss, I think Hosea is writing about it, he says, uh, verse number eight, y'all just look at verse eight. He says, how can, how can I give you up? You know, how can I hand you over, O Israel? How can I make you like Admah? How can I treat you like Zebul? My heart recoils within me. My compassion grows warm and tender. I will not execute my fierce anger. I will not again destroy Ephraim, for I am God and no mortal. I will not come in wrath. This is God working through his own, in a, in a way that we can see, God is working through his own dilemma of having to do something to his nation that has corrupted itself with idolatry and, and, and spiritual adultery. But it's not an easy thing. It's not like God does this in a stainless steel heart. You know, this is not the way God operates. He senses, feels, cares, and loves, and does not want to execute the judgment that he must do. So, uh, Hosea is like that. So you have these books that are there that kind of make it. Um, this can be comforting to us today too. Absolutely. With our nation being in the mess that we're in. Yeah. I'm sorry about that, Josh. I knocked my microphone off. Yeah, that's tr so sorry to the people wearing headphones. Please know that I did not mean to do that. <laughs> um, so let me take a quick look at one last thing, and then we'll call it a day. Um, there is a, a, just a little bit more. Let's see, 121, I think. Um, I think that... Um, oh, yeah, I do want to mention one other person because I think he was, he was important, and that would be uh, Amos. I'm going to put Amos up here because um, he was a reluctant prophet. He was a farmer. I don't know if you all know that about Amos, but he was very much a plain-spoken honest, straight-up guy. I really like Amos. So just for a minute, let's look at his book. Everybody turn to the book of Amos, and let's, I'll show you a few things that will help you when you get to it and you start reading it. You'll enjoy it better. So go to the book of Amos, and we'll go to the first chapter. Now remember, Hosea comes right before Joel, and Joel comes right before Amos. So chapter 1, verse 1 gives the setting. It says, uh, The words of Amos, who was among the shepherds of Tekoa, which he saw concerning Israel in the days of King Uzziah of Judah, and in the days of King Jeroboam, and son of Joash of Israel, two years before the earthquake. <clears throat> so you see that Amos was a contemporary of Isaiah. So we had a lot of prophetic activity going on during this particular time while the Assyrians and the Babylonians were increasing in power. So um, Amos begins with what we call a rhetorical method of teaching and preaching. Um, it goes something like this. Verse number three. It says, For three transgressions of Damascus and for four I will not revoke the punishment. And then if you'll look at verse number six, it says, for three transgressions of Gaza and for four, I will not revoke the punishment. When you watch through these first couple of chapters, this is how Amos does. He uses that little kind of a cadence. For three transgressions and for four, I'm not going to withhold my judgment, says the Lord. And then he talks about Damascus. For three 
you know, I, and for four, I'm not going to withhold my judgment upon it. And then he's going around to all of these nations. And then eventually he says to Judah, you are going to get it. And then he says to Israel, and you're going to get it. So we're all going to get it because God has reached a boiling point. He's about to bring about some change in the whole world. So it's a, I'm pretty sure that the people who were listening to Amos at first were going, amen, amen, amen. And then it's kind of like when he got to Israel, it was like, uh-oh, uh-oh. <laughs> when he got to Judah, I don't know. But it's a beautiful way to to proclaim the message. When you get to chapter 4, this is the, the Lord's man here. He is, uh, this is, he calls people cows, which I love. He says in verse number 4, 1 of, verse, of chapter 4, Hear this word, you cows of Bashan, who oppress the poor. He really does get after them. In verse number 6, he says, I gave you cleanness of teeth in all your cities and lack of bread. What he's saying was, you didn't have to worry about brushing your teeth, did you? Because you didn't have anything to eat. <laughs> <laughs> um, he sent pestilence and he sent all of these things, but none of those things made them return to him, according to verse number 11. And verse 12 says, therefore, since none of these things made you turn to me, get ready to meet God. So Amos is a quite a brave man. I do think that um, you you know he, they they hated him uh, and they wanted to kill him. Um, I wanted to show you that real quick story. Let me find that. It's at the end of chapter. Let's see. Yeah, they, they wanted to kill him. All right, look at uh, chapter 7. So, uh, ch chapter 7, verse 10. Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent to King Jeroboam of Israel, saying, Amos has conspired against you in the very center of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all his words, for thus Amos has said, Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel must go into exile away from his land. So Amaziah said to Amos, O seer, or in other words prophet, go, flee away to the land of Judah, earn, Judah, earn your bread there, prophesy there, but never again prophesy at Bethel, for it is the king's sanctuary, it is the temple of the kingdom. Now if you don't know what this is, this is somebody running the preacher off. Okay, So the preacher is preaching, and the guy who is one of the lead people says to the king, he's been talking about you. We're going to have to get rid of him. Let's send him to another church. Uh, and that's how it's unfolding at this point. That, that's putting it in modern language. Then verse 14. Then Amos answered Amos, I'm no prophet, nor a prophet's son, but I'm a herdsman, a dresser of sycamore trees. The Lord took me from following the flock. He said to me, Go prophesy to my people Israel. Now therefore hear the word of the Lord. You say, do not prophesy against Israel. Do not preach against the house of Isaac. Therefore thus says the Lord, your wife shall become a prostitute in the city. And your sons and your daughters shall fall by the sword. And your land shall be parceled out by line. You yourself shall die in an unclean land. And Israel shall surely go into exile away from its land. I wonder if that meeting ended on a good note. What do you think? It didn't sound like it. It didn't sound like it, did it? Well, these are the people that you're going to meet who are the prophets. And when you get to them and you start reading their books, it's not easy reading always, but you have to kind of at least know who they are, know their setting, and try to enjoy what, they, what they're doing because they're, they're helping to get the word across. Anybody got questions or comments? Okay, we'll call it a day then.